Okay. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce David Ludwig. Hi. <laughs> David is an associate professor in the Knowledge, Technology and Innovation Group of Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And he's also the PI of the Global Epistemologies and Ontologies project. Uh, and the project brings together approaches from ethnobiology and political ecology, uh, as well as philosophy of science and social epistemology uh, in order to understand heterogeneous knowledge about socio-environmental systems by actors that include indigenous farmers and lab scientists, and so contribute to debates around global challenges such as biodiversity, food production, and public health. The project also aims to reimagine philosophy as action research that contributes to interventions into these socio-environmental processes through dialogue with both empirical sciences and local communities about epistemological and ontological questions. David is also one of the editors of the forthcoming edited volume, Global Epistemologies and Philosophies of Science, uh, together with Sinclair and Kube, one of the organizers of this series uh, and others. And the collection develops a synthesizing perspective on the methodology of practicing philosophy of science from a global perspective, including feminist epistemology, decolonizing research methods, epistemologies of the South and global history of science, as well as exploring the relevance of philosophical tools for engaging in scientific practices in local settings. And this collection was one of the things along with uh, Veli Matova's special issue that uh, inspired uh, the creation of this series. So we're really uh, excited to hear him talk today uh, on the sub subject of how to decolonize your research methods, philosophy of slash as action research. So thank you, David, and over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. I'll try to share my screen now. Let's see how that goes. Can you see it? Perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks also, I guess, to all of the organizers for setting up also the series, which um, I think is both like really needed, but certainly also kind of tests, I guess, a comfort zone of um, academic philosophy. And so I'm really happy to be part of this. And I thought if I um, give a talk in this series, I should um, address some of the discomforts and some of the challenges head on by asking what it would mean to decolonize our own research methods. And so then only when I started um, working on the presentation, I kind of realized that that may sound as if I have an answer, right? Um, because that's how academic talks usually work, right? You ask a question in the title and then you give a presentation to answer that. Um, so there may be the expectation that I'm um, presenting something like this, like how to decolonize philosophy of science in three easy steps, right? So something like step one, um, pick case studies from the global south rather than from Europe or North America. Step two, um, pick a nice um, egalitarian normative framework. Step three, integrate that framework into an inclusive epistemology that allows you to talk about different standpoints or epistemic justice and so on. And uh, voila, um, philosophy has been decolonized. Now, I don't think that's going to work. And so when I wrote that question, I was not so much um, thinking of me providing a straightforward, three easy step answer, but rather was thinking of the kind of question that I'm asking myself when doing my research. So I guess like kind of a more adequate visual representation um, of what I had in mind would be a picture like this. Um, and I don't really mean that just in the sense that um, debates about decolonization and science are complicated. Um, most philosophical questions are complicated in some sense, right? But rather in the sense that uh, bringing questions of decolonization into science and into philosophy brings up a lot of um, 
a lot of contradictions, a lot of um, very difficult challenges of ch changing our own practices that I don't think we really have very clear cut answers to as, as a philosophy of science community or as a broader academic philosophy community. Um, and so rather than presenting a, like a three, uh, three step way of decolonizing your methods, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the insights that I had from my own kind of messy learning process over the past few years um, that kind of started with um, me doing a PhD as a philosopher of science on issues of scientific pluralism um, that had nothing to do with um, decolonization or the global south or indigenous knowledge or whatever. And only after my PhD, I kind of started using some of the tools that I had learned as a philosopher um, to think not only about scientific knowledge, but also about other forms of non-academic knowledge, if you want. Um, a lot of it in the biological and environmental domain. So I was kind of interested in thinking um, not only how, for example, academics produce knowledge about environments, but also how indigenous communities or um, peasant communities produce knowledge about their environments are often experts about these environments. And what that means then for philosophical reasoning about epistemic diversity, about ontological diversity and so on. And so a lot of it kind of started with me just kind of using the tools that I had already and applying them if you want to different case studies, but in this case, I'm not any more academic research, but kind of indigenous communities. Um, and that went well to some degree, but after a couple of years, I kind of realized um, how limited that approach was and how often I got stuck in terms of feeling that a lot of the philosophical theories that I was producing were not really that much relating to the epistemic practices and epistemic concerns of the communities that I was theorizing about, right? So in many ways that led to kind of a change in practice and learning process in which I started working with um, different research communities and mostly in uh, Mexico and in Brazil. And um, what you see here on, on the top row, um, is our initial meeting four years ago in Sao Paulo with, with some members of the Mexican team, Alfredo and Radames and Tanya. Um, what you see in the middle row um, is a workshop that we did a couple of years later in Salvador and Bahia with a um, Brazilian team on, on issues of knowledge integration. And um, then the, the bottom row, as you can see, now we're in Corona times. And um, that's where the meeting is digital there. That's our um, very recent research group um, on global epistemologies, or ontologies, GEOs, where we're trying to um, not only then apply the tools of philosophy to case studies in the global south, but we try to collectively um, negotiate how we're doing philosophy and how we're doing science. And so this is something that I think is a process where I may not come up with straight answers to how to decolonize your research methods. But I do think I've learned quite a bit um, that may also be interesting for you. And so for um, the rest of the talk, what I want to do is kind of divide it into parts. So the first part is about uh, rethinking science or scientific practices. And that will actually be, be the majority of my talk. Um, and I will frame that as philosophy of action research. Um, and then the last, I don't know, five minutes or so, I will um, move on to, to reflecting on, on what rethinking science means for rethinking also philosophical practice and philosophical research methods. And I will frame that as philosophy as action research. Okay, so what does it mean to kind of um, think about science um, through cases of the global south? Um, I guess one thing that, that's important here to realize is um, how quickly we run into contradictions and how difficult they are to resolve with our standard tools of philosophy of science. 
And so what I want you to do first is focus on the picture in the background. So what you see there, um, obviously it's a march for science. Many of you will that remember that, that was in, I think in 2017, this global rally of people protesting against anti-science populism, against um, anti-intellectualism, um, especially related to um, climate change at that point. Um, today, of course, you may think also of corona and anti-vax movement and so on. Often with the idea that science is something that must be defended against some kind of authoritarian irrationality that either ignores our evidence or outright rejects it. Now, in the second step, what I want you to do is look at the quote that comes from uh, the Colombian um, anthropologist and post-development scholar Arturo Escobar. So he writes that in third world contexts, science has become the most central political technology of authoritarianism, irrationality, and oppression of peoples and nature. As a reason of state, science operates as the most effective item of violent development and even standardizes the formats of dissent. Organized science thus becomes ineffective as an ally against authoritarianism and increasingly dependent on market-based vested interests. So we have a very clear contradiction here, right? Like on the one hand, the idea that, that science is our best ally against authoritarian irrationality. And uh, you may think of climate change or Corona or whatever in that. Um, and then Escobar claiming that um, science actually is a political technology of authoritarian irrationality, right? Um, and I guess that type of critique, I will mostly uh, refer to, to the Latin American context, but similar critiques are of course also um, common in other contexts of the global South. That's why I use that framing of science must be defended versus science must fall, where science must fall, of course, refers to like the South African debates uh, coming from the roads must fall. So how shall we engage with that kind of contradiction of these kind of very different ideas of what science is and how it affects society? Well, um, you may try to find the answer by asking philosophers of science, right? It's their job to think about science and the role of science in society. But I think we kind of have to be honest there. Um, and if we look at philosophy of science as it at least exists in its kind of core mainstream currently, if you would like open one of the flagship journals of philosophy of science, or if you would go to one of the major conferences, you would find very little on these kind of tensions. And you actually find very little on the way how science affects livelihoods in the global South, how it affects people whether it's peasant communities or urban underclasses or indigenous people or whatever. Um, and I think currently as a discipline, we're largely unprepared to, to engage with these kind of contradictions. And as such also with the challenge of decolonization of these kind of very different ideas of how knowledge production works and how it affects people's lives. So how should we think about that contradiction? One thing that I find helpful is um, what I've started to call the kind of the problem of reference sciences. So if you think of science in this kind of positive way as something that needs to be defended, right, against authoritarian irrationality, you're probably going to think of scientific fields and case studies like the ones that you see on the left, right, like something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, full of scientific experts and cutting edge science and evidence that's then ignored by policymakers or in public discourse or outright rejected, right? Or you may think of Dr. Fauci doing his face palm during like one of um, Trump's um, Corona press conferences, right? And in these contexts, it seems very clear that science is something that needs to be defended against anti-science populism, right? If you use the kind of frame that, that Arturo Escobar is using of 
saying that science has become ineffective as something that, that stands against authoritarianism has itself become a political technology of it, right? You will think, we'll think of very different sciences in very different contexts, like the ones on the right. right? You may think, for example, of the way agriculture affects people around the world. Um, for example, the debates about genetic modification that often came with all kinds of great promises of reducing hunger and malnutrition, um, for example, through the, through the golden rice, and then often produced something like these so-called Roundup Ready soybeans that are genetically modified to allow the application of Monsanto's Roundup pesticide. And in that sense, for example, genetically modified seeds have been indeed part of the push to industrialize agriculture around the world. There's all kinds of negative effects that we'll talk about. Um, or you may think of, for example, environmental issues, nature resource management, uh, the way how a lot of nature resource management negatively affects the most marginalized um, within uh, many countries of the global south. So what you see here at the bottom is a, is a protest against the um, Belo Monte Dam in, in Brazil, in the Amazon, that displaced um, um, a lot of Kayapo communities. And you can also think of cases of well-meaning biodiversity uh, conservation um, that were focused on, let's say, um, protecting a vulnerable species, but then have the effect that people who live there and who are often the poorest in the country are not allowed to farm anymore, are not allowed to hunt anymore, and so on. So the way how we think about science depends a lot on the case studies and on the disciplines that we look at, right? And I think that's actually something that a lot of philosophers of science are quite familiar with um, because often the, the history of philosophy of science is told in a way that in the early 20th century, a lot of the debate was dominated by general philosophy of science that looked at questions of the structure of science in general but then often only used examples from physics or the physical sciences towards um, a diversification of what then became first called the philosophy of the special sciences in the 70s, philosophy of cognitive sciences, philosophy of economy, philosophy of the social sciences, to the current state where we're having um, a lot of very specialized philosophical debates about, let's say, something like philosophy of microbiology or um, philosophy of climate science, right? But I do think that what's often missing, at least at the core of the field, are philosophical engagements with the kind of fields that um, most directly affect people's lives and livelihoods in the global south. Right? We don't really have a very prominent philosophy of agricultural sciences. We don't really have any philosophy of development studies. There's, there's not a whole lot of debate on um, philosophy of global health or philosophy of nat nature resource management and so on. And so I'm going to kind of um, call all of these sciences that, that most directly interact with people's livelihoods um, action research sciences. Um, we can get back to that later. But right now my, cl uh, my claim is just that um, if we shift the kind of example, like the examples that we use and the kind of reference sciences that we work with, I think we can actually make more progress in thinking about issues of decolonization and thinking critically about the epistemology of science. And so what I want to do is kind of distinguish between three different modes, epistemic modes of um, action research that I'm going to call epistemic paternalism, epistemic diversity, and epistemic decolonization. And to start with, um, I have here two um, pictures from my last field work um, in, in spring last year, right before everything got shut down due to Corona. And I was um, spending some time at this organization called CIMIT in Mexico, that is um, just north of Mexico City, that was led by this guy, Norman Borlaug, who has a statue here, uh, and who is widely um, 
kind of known as the father of the green revolution, right? So as the father of the agricultural revolution that led to like the modernization of agricultural production around the world, usually with the kind of humanitarian um, idea or at least framing of bringing people out of hunger and out of poverty. And so he was awarded um, the Nobel Peace Prize and in 1970 for his work with um, better plant varieties and um, better um, or more productive agricultural production. And if you enter the campus of Simit, you can see how much that identity is still part of what, how the institution sees itself and how it frames itself. So this is like the entrance of the campus on the left where there's this huge poster of maize and wheat signs for improved livelihoods. Now, one thing that's interesting is that um, debates about the green revolution have become incredibly contested with radically different framings. So on the one hand, there is a green revolution as kind of a symbol for, for the idea of ending hunger, ending poverty through better science and through better technology, right? And that's why, for example, Borlaug was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for his scientific work. Um, on the other hand, in recent decades, um, the green revolution has become much more often been used as a symbol for like brutal modernization of the global, global South with all kinds of negative environmental and social effects. And um, so I'm using this picture in the background to just kind of visually represent some of the, I think rather straightforward negative impacts that you can think of. If you see like a huge industrial farm like this, of course you can wonder what happened to the biodiversity of the land. Right? That, was, that was there before the, before the farm was there. Um, and of course, industrial agriculture can often be incredibly harmful for biodiversity, for, for soil and so on. You can also think of all kinds of negative social and economic impacts. Like where does the land come from? Well, typically those huge farms are on land that were already used by small, um, smallholder farmers by peasants who were, like, had small plots of land where they were growing their plants and vegetables. So where do they work now? Where do they get their food from now? Right? So there are all kinds of um, positive ideals, unintended consequences that make the Green Revolution an incredibly contested topic. Now, we don't have time to talk about all of this. I just want to talk about the epistemological dimension of this contestation. Um, because often what I think um, anthropologists have shown very convincingly, um, these kind of agricultural modernization programs fail for epistemic reasons. Um, and so I'm just referring you to, to two books here by two anthropologists, uh, the first one by Stephen Lansing, who did his fieldwork in, in Bali in the 1970s during like the Green Revolution there. And then the second book by James Scott, that's more broadly on how top-down state-driven interventions fail, but it also has a, a chapter on the Ujamaa campaign in Tanzania and the ways in which its agricultural modernization often failed. And so in both cases, I have, I think, a quite a telling um, quote at the bottom so first Lansing on the left side, writing of a frustrated American irrigation engineer claiming these people don't need a high priest, they need a hydrologist. And so the story here is that rice farming in Bali was organized through water temples that would regulate the stream of water um, into the rice fields. And then the Green Revolution engineers um, who came to Bali thought that was like terribly inefficient and outdated. And they came up with a scientific plan that completely backfired and led to all kinds of um, water shortages and pest outbreaks and so on. In the case of Scott, there is a quote of where he talks about a provincial agricultural officer who says, the African has neither the training skill nor equipment to diagnose his soil erosion troubles nor can he plan the measures which are based on scientific knowledge. And this is where I think we rightly come in. 
So again, the idea of like an external group of scientists and engineers coming into an environment, trying to organize things more efficiently, purely on the basis of scientific knowledge. And again, the story is one of failure in which um, people did not want to live in these scientifically organized villages and the scientifically organized agriculture actually was often not appropriate for local environmental uh, conditions at all. So what's happening in these kind of cases um, is what I kind of refer to as epistemic paternalism, the idea that scientists have like all the necessary and the only kind of valid knowledge for, um, for intervening and um, changing practices, in this case, agricultural practices, um, while the local knowledge is completely disregarded and is seen as backwards and not relevant. And the effect is often that the interventions fail because they do not fit the local circumstances. Now, these kind of problems have become very widely reflected within the research um, for development community that has become all about epistemic diversity. And um, I do think that this reflects um, maybe in, in, in slight um, disagreement with, with what Veli said two weeks ago about the different rationals for decolonization. It very much reflects an epistemic rational rather than just a conceptual or moral um, rational. The idea that if you want to design real life interventions in real life context, whether it's agriculture or environment or health or whatever, you need to recognize how expertise is distributed very widely between different, uh, between different epistemic actors, both academic and non-academic. And a lot of the first wave of research for development that was completely top down and completely paternalistic failed to come up with uh, intervention that actually helped people because those scientists did not have the adequate knowledge about local economic circumstances, about local environments, about local cultures, and so on. Um, and the only way to, to respond to that is to acknowledge the diversity of epistemic actors within scientific interventions. And so that has led to a huge bubble of, if you want, buzzwords in the research of development community. Um, people talking about things like um, citizen science and co-creation and co-management and co-leadership and collaboration and interdisciplinarity and multi-stakeholder governance, multi-stakeholder platform, intercultural dialogue, open science, participatory research, participatory action research, participatory design, transdisciplinarity, upstream engagement, and so on and so on. And so in all of these um, concepts, um, although they of course have different kind of histories, um, the idea is to kind of open the epistemic space and to create space for epistemic diversity within research for development. Um, so does that mean then that that community has been successfully decolonized, right? Everyone has a seat at the table, everyone gets to bring in their knowledge and, um, and we've kind of succeeded with the decolonization project. Well, um, obviously it's not that simple. And one thing that I've learned from interacting with these communities is um, that one of the main risks is something that um, I've started to call the one happy family pluralism, which is basically the idea that we can just kind of stack up knowledges in the way like you can stack up fluids in this glass, right? So first we have the knowledge of the natural scientist, then you have the knowledge of the social scientist, then you have the knowledge of the local community. And in the end, you just have a much larger knowledge base that allows you to come up with a much better intervention. Um, and then together, we work together to, to make the world a better place. Um, that's typically not what happens if you have very different epistemic actors trying to renegotiate how to intervene in the world. Um, and so I just want to highlight, I think, two core problems. The one is that, that knowledge is not just like a set of propositions, right? That you can just kind of add up, but rather the knowledge of different actors is embedded in very different types of practices. It's, it's formulated through very different ontologies. It's connected to very different values that often suggest um, very different goals, very different methods, very different types of interventions. 
Um, and so if you want to learn more about that, I would very much recommend the book that you see on the, on the, on the right that's called Hunters and Bureaucrats by another anthropologist, Paul Nandasti, um, who worked with, um, in, in, um, with First Nations and Canadian government scientists and tells the story of knowledge integration as a, star as a story of failures, which I think are very, um, are very important to reflect on if you actually want to try to bring knowledge diversity together. And then there's a second part of, um, I guess, a political economy of science, right? It's not just about trying to bring different epistemic practices and ontologies or values together. It's also the power structures between these kind of actors that are often, of course, very much entrenched in the development context with projects of economic growth and modernization that typically lead to certain actors um, being heard while other actors are not being heard. And often also the knowledge of local communities only being integrated in cases where it fits overall frameworks that are set, for example, by NGOs or by, uh, by scientists who, who do development work. So <clears throat> what I want to emphasize from this is that it's important to, to be clear that epistemic diversity and acknowledging epistemic diversity is not the same as epistemic decolonization. Um, and more precisely, um, epistemic decolonization is not just about recognizing diverse knowledges and then integrating them into the already existing scientific structures that define the questions, goals, methods, frameworks, concepts, ontologies, et cetera, but rather epistemic decolonization is about recognizing diverse knowledges and mobilizing them to challenge colonial legacies and injustices in the way how current scientific structures define questions, goals, methods, frameworks, concepts, ontologies, and so on. Now that all sounds really nice, right? Um, but so, so how to do that? Um, and so my first impulse would be to kind of refer back to, to the cat picture that I started with, because obviously I don't have um, like a simple three-step answer to that. Um, but that's also probably because there is no simple three-step answer because it is about a very messy learning process of changing the way how we're doing science. Um, and the kind of processes for which we do research. Um, and so that's something where I think I can at least talk a little bit about my own experience from the kind of field work that we've been um, starting to do in the GEOS project and that our Brazilian partners have been doing. So what you, you see here are like uh, four pictures from, from a small village in the Northeast of Brazil um, called Cebinha, where much of our field work has been located. And so part of what the ambition there is, is not just to go there with our own predefined concepts and methods and ontologies and, and so on, but rather to negotiate that together with the community, right? So what you see here, for example, on the top row is, um, uh, on the top right is like community workshop that one of our PhD students, Gabi, organized that was kind of about different ways of identifying problems in the community, different courses of action that can be taken. Um, at the bottom left is Vitor, another PhD um, candidate in our project, um, going um, towards the boats with a fisherman uh, where he's um, then um, studying the fisherman knowledge about um, and the fisher practices in the in the mangroves, so what they know about the fish, how they relate to the fish, and so on. And then, of course, work together with um, the actors in the community and trying to figure out um, what kind of questions should be raised, what kind of problems should be addressed, and how scientists can contribute to that in a positive way. For example, together with the teachers of the communities that you see at the bottom right. So I don't really have time to talk in detail about the empirical work we do, but maybe that comes up in the discussion. Um, but I just want to um, say something, I guess, about the overall vision of how to do science there, um, because the idea is not just to um, either defend science as something that, that 
that's of positive impact for the community or reject science as something that is um, in itself authoritarian or something like that. Um, but rather the idea is to um, collectively build processes of negotiation and imagination of what scientists can do in these communities in order to actually engage in meaningful ways with people's livelihoods. So to wrap this up, um, what I wanted to, to say in terms of um, action research and these research for development communities is that we can distinguish between three different epistemic modes. Uh, the first one that I called epistemic paternalism, the idea that you do cutting edge science, let's say plant breeding and plant genomics in order to come up with better seed varieties that then improve the livelihoods of marginalized actors. And obviously that's often a very good thing to do, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's very also important to recognize that that has very little to do with epistemic decolonization. The, 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 authority, the epistemic authority is located solely with the scientists. Um, and as I've showed earlier um, in the stories about the Green Revolution, often that backfires in the sense that scientists have not the appropriate knowledge to make things work for people's livelihoods within specific contexts. And then the second epistemic mode is what I called epistemic diversity, the idea of applying science together with marginalized actors, bringing in their knowledge in order to design better interventions, whether it's in agriculture or health or in, in environment or whatever you're interested in. And often, of course, that's also a very good thing to do. At the same time, I'm, I would also be hesitant in calling that decolonization as long as the actors only bring in their knowledge to answer the questions that have been already defined by the scientists and whose knowledge is only recognized if it is validated according to the standards of the scientists, right? Um, and so the third um, mode would then be epistemic decolonization as a process of actually negotiating how science should be done, what questions should be asked, what methods should be apply, employed together with those actors. Great, so I could stop here, but I still want to take something like, like five or six minutes because I promised the second part of rethinking philosophical practice. And this will be short because I just want to um, provide some ideas of what these three modes, epistemic modes may mean for doing philosophy. So in terms of epistemic paternalism, I think that's something that uh, we find quite commonly when philosophers engage with um, issues in the global, uh, global South. And the, the basic idea would be just you have whatever framework that you're working with, right? Whether it's Carnapian or Kantian or Foucauldian or Habermasian or Heideggerian or Walsian or whatever. Um, and you just um, apply that to, to issues in the global South. And, and that could be like, whether it's global problems, right? Problems of like world poverty or whatever interpreted through your Kantian framework or whether it's a like more localized problem. And I don't want to say that that's all bad, right? Just as in the, in the scientific case, um, like the early wave of the, of the Green Revolution idea that like stop people from starving in, in many cases, right? So a lot of positive impacts were there. And I do think that philosophical work that's done that way can also have positive impacts. At the same time, um, it's clearly not epistemic decolonization because epistemic authority is just kind of located with whatever like Western framework you work with. Um, and I do think that there are quite a lot of risks of that backfiring in the sense that it is inappropriate in, in terms of whatever kinds of normative conclusions you come up with. Then the second, the second um, of kind of mode uh, that I called epistemic diversity, I think is, is very common in current like globally oriented philosophy uh, where you have like whatever philosophical issues that you're interested in or whatever problems you're interested in, 
And then you see what people in the global south were thinking about it or are thinking about it. And I think that's very much how a lot of my own research started, right? Where I was kind of starting as a philosopher of biology, being interested in issues of classification and so on. And then I was just kind of trying to understand um, what the perspective, for example, of indigenous per people are on, on how the biological world is classified. I think it's also how a lot of historical work happens, right? So for example, if you're um, you maybe interested in issues like philosophical skepticism, and then you can look what half classical Chinese or classical Indian authors said about it. Um, I think it also kind of describes how a lot of experimental philosophy works right now. You may have like a already defined problem, like the definition of knowledge as justified true belief. And then you check what people around the world think about that definition. And again, I don't want to say that like any of that is bad. I think a lot of that research is very valuable in kind of stressing the diversity of epistemic actors. Um, at the same time, I would be hesitant to call it epistemic decolonization as long as the philosophical problems or issues or questions are still entirely um, <coughs> framed in terms of like whatever um, Western philosophical framework you come from. So then what would count as epistemic decolonization? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on whatever area you work in. You may be like a philosopher of biology or like a philosopher of art or an ethicist or an um, epistemologist or whatever, but you have like some kind of area of expertise. And I guess decolonization there would not just mean to see what people in other parts of the world have thought about your problems, but rather to think collectively and together about what kind of questions to ask, what kind of goals to pursue in that philosophical community, what methods to uh, employ, what frameworks to use, and so on and so on. And so that's been very much, I guess, um, my experience, um, kind of going through that messy learning process of, of trying to figure out how I do philosophy as someone who's been trained as a philosopher of biology primarily. Um, and I, of course, had my own um, more narrowly defined philosophical questions about epistemology and ontology when thinking about that project. But a lot of the questions have changed through these interactions. Um, and for example, they have become much more focused on issues of uh, practices, um, agricultural practices, educational practices, conservation practices, policy, and how they interact with different ways of knowing and different ontologies and areas where they actually matter for those communities. This very much changed my, my methods, right? So I started to do um, work from the famous philosophical armchair, just using my philosophical theories and just basically throwing them at ethnographic data. Um, and now I'm trying to figure out how to do empirical field work myself as a philosopher, right? It has kind of changed the, the types of um, outputs that I'm creating where, where a few years back, I was mostly writing like the typical single authored philosophy paper. And now much of what I do is, is much more collectively um, defined. Um, and so I don't think that I have an easy answer to kind of how to change those processes precisely because it is a, a messy learning process, but I do think we can make progress. And so that is also then my, my, my last slide here, because I think what I really want to stress is that this is kind of the type of progress that we need to make together, right? Because it's not about writing one brilliant philosophy paper about what epistemic decolonization really is, um, but rather it's a collective task of changing our institutional cultures, our institutional structures. Um, and I do think we have a long way to go there, but at the same time, I also see, for example, this seminar series is something that, that that very much um, shows that there's interest in, in, in creating that change. Um, also our GEOS group, um, also upcoming publications like the book that we're doing on global epistemologies and philosophies of science or um, the special issue on the epistemic decolonization that was edited by Vili that was already mentioned in the last session. 
and so so I'm ending with a with a cat study once more, um, just because I uh, I do think we have a long way to go there, and it comes with a lot of confusion. Um, but I do think that um, we are actually in the process of rethinking some of this, and we can make quite a bit of progress in that together. Thank you very much, and I guess we're shifting towards uh, discussion now.